and they're listening to music or they're um, they're just using a, an app that is taking a lot of, um, is it bandwidth? I don't know. It's taking a lot of brain power. So it will slow down the Zoom. Um, but maybe think about how you want to, to manage that Zoom meeting and then instruct your, your students how or when they're going to turn their camera on or off. Um, consider um, encouraging your students to use real names when they're logging into their Zoom. And towards the end, you'll see I've got a little attendance section here and I'll, I'll explain to you how much easier that, mean, that that is to take attendance when your students are using their real names. So then I know, I know which students are on camera because they're using their real name and then students can get to know each other because they're using those names as well. Um, I always tell my students to mute when they're not contributing. Um, I, I have had a student um, go through the entire McDonald's um, um, drive-through, <laughs> order, have a whole conversation with the girl that took his order, paid for the order, everything not on mute, and we just had to wait. I mean, I did eventually mute him, but we were kind of just wondering, we were trying to talk to him and see if he was going to realize that he wasn't on mute, but um, encourage your students or teach your students to mute. Um, also, um, consider designating a chat monitor. This has really helped in my class because I am at the board a lot. Um, and that means I'm not always looking at my chat. So I'm terrible. I'm terrible at, at watching that chat and answering questions. And I know that about my teaching, but I don't want those questions to go unanswered. And I don't necessarily want students to just answer them incorrectly. I don't want someone else to answer a chat incorrectly. So I started um, designating somebody in my in person for part of class to be the chat monitor. <coughs> and they're managing that screen and they can stop me in class and um, we can talk about a, a problem or a concern or um, just a question that a student might have. That, that's been really helpful. Even when, um, like I said, like that, that zooming will slow down and the students will say things aren't very clear on screen but it, it's really hard in our classroom at least to hear my my zoomers um, sometimes their voices don't carry very well in our classroom um i i just wanted to point out the end meeting for all and the leave meeting i wonder if i can i i don't think i can bring that up while i'm sharing my screen but you've all left your meeting before um just think about this isn't necessarily something you need to teach your students about but think about when you're ending that meeting the difference between ending the meeting for everybody which means that that zoom meeting is going to get cut off entirely and everybody's kicked out of the zoom or you even even if you're the host you as the host can leave the meeting but your students are still in the meeting and sometimes they just want to talk and they want to they want to be a class and get to know each other or talk about class things, um, even though you might leave and have other things to do. So I will often leave my meeting open for students and they really like that they've requested me to do that so that they can visit with each other and just talk about class instead of me cutting everybody off. Um, and that took me a little, that took me a few weeks to learn. Um, the last one is attendance. Um, and I, I have some slides I wanna show you if, oops, sorry. Hold on a second. Oh, hold on, I've lost my screen. Oh, see, I knew that was gonna happen. Sorry guys, I lost my screen. I'm trying to find my... <laughs> There we go. Sorry about that. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. I want to show you um, attendance. If if you haven't um, ran reports on Zoom, this is a really great link. For me, this has been good to take um, attendance on 35 students really quickly. Um, if you go to your Zoom account um, where you have your settings and you find that reports tab, um, click on your reports tab and then you can put in your date, the, the date that you want to check attendance. And this will give you 
attendance up to a month. Um, it will only do a month at a time. At least that's all I've been able to do. I was just looking for a few days for this section here. So I've got October 26th to the 31st, and then I'm gonna search those dates. And once I do that, it's going to bring me to this participant source. So I can see I had 36 students, that's, that's 35 plus me. Um, so if you click on that, that will open up to now an attendance report and you can see um, you can see your students names so this is why I, I like to have students use their first name or just their real name so I can see their student name I can see when they joined when they left so here's our duration here and um, it allows me to to really take attendance here so I can see this student was on for two minutes and these students were on for the, it looks like the duration of the class. Um, you do have to keep in mind, you'll sometimes see, I don't have an example here, but you'll sometimes see Katie might have gotten on um, two or three times and you'll see two minutes, two minutes, two minutes. It might mean that she got kicked off or the Zoom slowed down and it counts it as, a, as an end. And then she got back on. So you might see several uh, students coming in and out for a few minutes at a time, but that's usually because they're they're having a slow Zoom. Um, but this has been really helpful to just quickly check attendance. And when a student comes to me and says um, they didn't understand something or they missed something, I can look here and say, well, that's because you were in class for two minutes. You got into class, but you didn't stay. So I can I can clearly see that. <clears throat> Um, next few things, um, just quickly, I, I want to, some things that I think have helped um, connect with my students. I think you all know how to use Zoom pretty well. I just want to do some basic things there. Um, but invite, I, I've been inviting my students to meet with me informally in these small groups. Um, prior to COVID, um, I would do a sign up genius and I, um, I, I realized my, my teaching is we've got a cohort and it's it's different than than most um, other instructors but I I'm in charge of 35 students and those are my students for the semester so I don't have huge amounts of students like I know most of you have um, but at least for that for this for this nursing course um, I'll send out an email a few weeks before school starts and I I have them come into my office and we do a 15 minute get to know you just quick kind of um, kind of interview session with them. And I just talk to them about their concerns and their needs, but that's really time consuming. And then with COVID, it was just harder to get students in the building. Um, so this semester and last semester, I invited students to meet with me informally in small groups by Zoom. So I sent out a sign up genius in to ask for little groups of students I did five and I said I just like to meet with you really informally for about 20 minutes and just chat just talk about um what what are what are your hopes what are your concerns I just want to get to know you and and they get to know this small little group so during this meeting I will draw on their online experience so I'll ask them things like what techniques and tools have you liked or disliked in other classes um, some students will tell me they liked, I had a student tell me they liked the way an instructor asked them a question and then put them in breakout sessions to talk about that question and come back together and get that discussion started for the day. Um, other, another student told me that um, they really hated recorded lectures. They hated to watch recorded lectures because they couldn't um, ask any questions. So it just gave me some ideas for what my students needs were and things that I hadn't thought about being an instructor and not a student. Um, I will also in this meeting explicitly ask students to consider talking in class more than usual. Um, I have I found that Zoom, uh, I'm doing sometimes a three to four hour class. I know that's not ideal, um, but that's how we do classes um, with little breaks in between. Um, so a three to four hour class with maybe a 10, 15 minute break in between is a long time to just listen to an instructor drone on and on. And I will explain that to students that the class will really fall flat if I don't get people to participate, to ask questions, to give scenarios and to really get a discussion going. So 
in a small group of four or five students when I'm having this little informal discussion, I can usually get them to commit to being more verbal online. Um, and I'll, I'll even challenge them to say or chat at least one thing during class so that I get we get a chance to hear from everybody. Um, the last thing, of course, I'm just talking to my students about um, what what's going on with each of my students. I, I get to see them now in their home setting um, and I'm just asking them about themselves. And now they're sharing their, their experiences. Um, they're sharing their concerns. They're sharing, basically I'm asking them, what have you been doing during quarantine? Like what's, what, what are your hobbies? What are your goals? What, what worries you? And I'm surprised at how open they are even in this, in this small group. So for example, last semester, I met with five students at a time. Uh, I had Amanda who told me that her teenage son was having seizures. Um, she was really concerned because she hadn't been able to get him into a neurologist. He wasn't on medication and she was so worried that he was going to stop breathing at night. She was having him um, come into her room at night and just watching him all night because he kept having seizures. Um, so I, I'm taking notes on this, that this is what my student is going through during the semester. She's concerned for him. She's really not sleeping very well. And she's trying to get this neurologist appointment. And I need to be aware of that. Um, Caitlin was a student that told me that over quarantine, she was learning how to make cakes and she's been YouTubing and becoming a really um, amazing cake decorator. And she showed us pictures of what she had been working with um, and that it was her daughter's second birthday and she was making a unicorn cake. So just kind of interesting. Um, Chantel told me that she had just moved from Hawaii, that her husband had been diagnosed with um, pancreatic cancer and had three weeks to live. Um, and so she was moving to Arizona um, to get help from her family. Um, thankfully, it turned out that, um, this is in, in, you know, keep your perspective here, but thankfully it turned out that it was not pancreatic cancer, it was testicular cancer. He was treated um, very well and he's well into remission. Things are, things are good. But I get this idea of what's happening with the student. Um, Ray tells me she's expecting her first child. It's a girl. She's worried about becoming a mother and doing nursing school at the same time. And my last student, Alyssa, um, she just got married. She likes to play the drums. Um, and she's, she's a little sad because she can't work out during COVID. Uh, all, the, all the gyms are closed. So in 20 minutes, I get a really good idea for how these five students, some, some interesting things about them. I'm taking notes. So that now during class, I can um, really use those experiences and, um, and I, can, I can draw on those during class and really they understand that I know who they are. So now that class begins, um, even though I want my class to be really student-centered, at the beginning of class, at least for Zoom, I have found that I really have to share more about myself than I usually do. And I'm not a big personal sharer. So this has been a little bit hard for me to do, but it's been worth it because when I share things about myself, um, my students are more willing to share about themselves. So um, for example, over quarantine, most of my, I think all my Zoom classes were done in my home. Um, mostly in my kitchen. I was setting up on my counter and I was doing class in my kitchen. So now my students were invited into my home and they would have questions about things that were hanging up or my kids would walk by and it became really easy to talk about my kids. Um, I would talk about um, my shifts at the hospital or um, my future plans for running the world, which sometimes is our conversations. Um, so I can be kind of quirky. And the more that I was willing to share that quirkiness with them, students would say, hey, I agree with that. Or yeah, I, I can, I identify with that. And then they would start sharing with each other. And we, it, it almost felt like we became a, a, a closer class on Zoom than we did in person. And, and I, it felt like the more I was willing to share about myself, um, the more my students were willing to get to know each other and kind of break down those barriers. Um, and I'll come to these pictures in just a minute. 
Um, the use of breakout rooms, I'm not going to um, steal Dr. Klein's thunder. He's going to talk about breakout rooms, but consider using those breakout rooms for um, um, if you have previously in your in your face to face classes had more in person discussions, um, consider those breakout rooms and bringing that and them back in to discuss. Um, also, uh, consider assigning or drawing on student discussions or those canvas posts that you may have. Consider using some of those posts that you find especially interesting or sometimes I'll take a really quiet student who is not always, uh, they're not really discussing much in class. They're not sharing very much in the chat. So I'll purposely look through a discussion and find something that they wrote about and then bring that into a classroom discussion so that that I, it seems like the student then um, feels maybe a little bit flattered, maybe a little bit more engaged. They know that I'm recognizing what they wrote and that and that what they wrote has now become kind of the crux of our discussion for that day. Um, require or maybe incentivize conferences. Um, in nursing, it's really easy to require things of students. So I, I make students come talk to me in a conference at the midterm and um, a few weeks before the final. Um, not that it's hard to require, they're always willing to do that, but um, I, sometimes incentivizing students to come in and visit with you. And, and I really mean by Zoom or in person, um, but that can be a great way to connect with students individually and let them know that you know who they are, that you care about who they are, and you're just assessing those needs all along the way um, so that you can early, hopefully by midterm, you really want to know what are those needs and how can we really help you to be successful. The last one um, is making that Zoom technology an ally into building connection. Um, so many times um, my students, they're, they're really nervous about having to come to Zoom, that, that we're not doing face-to-face. -face. They want to be in person um, and that Zoom is seen as a barrier to their learning. So I'm, I'm trying to make that an ally and, and really show them how, um, how accommodating Zoom can be. So I, I started doing um, office hours that were scheduled once or twice a week and my schedule <laughs> on Zoom. And then my students would just know at this time, Chalet is always on Zoom, they can pop in. If I'm with a student at that time, I make them wait in a waiting room. Um, but they, they can do whatever they need to. They're in that waiting room. And then I just pull them in as soon as we're ready. And then we're in there. We're, we're pretty comfortable. They're in their home. And that home setting seems to just allow them to be much more um, vulnerable and honest and just tell me what their needs are. And um, we were able to troubleshoot them a little bit more. Um, I feel like getting, I've gotten to know them even more actually through Zoom and just that comfort of them being at home and the home setting has allowed us to have these really, um, really great conversations and allowed me to see into that home. I can see how their internet is working. I can see when they just pulled three little babies onto their lap and I say, wow, where, where are the babies coming from? And then they tell me that they've got their sister's kids, they've gotten custody of their sister's kids because of all these problems. And then I think, okay, we've got more than, we, we've got more problems than what, what initially, not problems, but we've got some Gosh. needs that I need to address. Um, and I can see that really easily on, on Zoom. Um, so just as kind of, it, it's kind of silly, but um, the student, Caitlin, um, she knew because, because I knew she had been working on cakes um, in class, I said that my daughter wanted a Harry Potter snitch cake. If you're a Harry Potter fan, the snitch is the little flying ball. Um, so this was my attempt. She sent me videos on how to make an amazing snitch cake. Um, I think I nailed it. I do you guys <laughs> do you guys see the snitch there? It's supposed to be gold with wings. These are wings. <laughs> I don't have the love. <laughs> I just don't have it. I want it, but I don't have it. But I really did try. She wasn't impressed. Um, <laughs> my other student, um, Alyssa, she sent me this video because she said that she was really sad that she couldn't work out over quarantine. So I just want to show you this quick video. Um, take it, take it for 
in the spirit that it was sent, it's just a silly little video. So don't be offended. Um, but this is what she sent me. Hey y'all, I'm Pamela Pepkin and you're about to do Pamela Pepkin's quarantine workout. Wash your hands, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. Woo! That's great, y'all. Let's dry those suckers off. Hey, COVID-19, you don't scare us. I've got 19 ways to destroy your ass. Work that size and sanitize. Work that size and sanitize. Work that size and sanitize. Sanitize. We're spraying. And we're praying. We're spraying. And we're praying. Double time. Spray, 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 spray. And stay inside, move side to side. Well, I hope you guys could see that and hear it. Um, it it's just, it's so nice when a student, you feel like you have this connection and the student um, is willing to send you these silly things about themselves because they know that you care. And I, I hope my students understand that I, I do care. I'm trying to reach out the best that I can, um, even if it's in a remote um, method, but um, I hope that this lends to some success um, and some, um, we've talked about anxiety and depression just a couple days ago with, mm. with Greg. And, and so these, I hope can just be some ways that you think about um, how we can connect with those students. So they may have any questions. All right, thanks guys. Thank you, Shalay, that's fabulous. Um, all right, so uh, I think Pete, you're up next. Is that right? Yes. Um, we've got until ten o'clock, right? So I'm thinking that you've since I'm on, we've got until ten thirty. Until ten thirty. All right. I'll. Okay. Um, I'll go through this quickly. Um, Dr. Wood is creating a folder. Uh, on uh, the R drive where we can put our PowerPoints and other materials so that if you'd like to take a look at them later on, they'll be available to you. So let me just tell you that. Uh, so what I want to address briefly is working with the proctor of a dual enrollment ITV class. Okay, is my PowerPoint visible? Looks like it is. So partnering with your proctor. And the thing to remember, and those of you who have taught ITV for a while, you know this, is that the proctor that you work with in a dual enrollment class is really the key player in the success of that class. Particularly because dual enrollment is so much different than working with traditional college students. We have students who have their graduation status on the line, for instance. You're going to be dealing with counselors. You're going to be dealing with parents as well as the students. So there's a lot of additional concern there. And being proactive and having a good proactive proctor really just makes your life easy. Uh, during the time that I've taught uh, dual enrollment ITV, I've worked with a good number of proctors. And really the best consistently was always coming up Duncan. I mean, there have been other good proctors, but uh, Deborah Roten and her, her, her daughter uh, Mindy in particular just really managed the classroom very well which again, you, you have to be more hands-on with these high school students to ensure their success and also to prevent headaches for you down the road. So I just want to talk about a few things to take into consideration. So you really need to open that dialogue early on and don't take things for granted. <clears throat> um, number one, be sure that your proctor knows that you view her or him as a colleague. Uh, oftentimes you're working with somebody who is a, an aide, a professional, um, sometimes you'll be working with somebody who is working on his or her bachelor's degree in education, and they can feel like working with a college instructor can be intimidating. So you need to break down that barrier and let them know that you respect them and that in partnering with them, you want to ask the proctor to share their insights and preferences in managing the classroom environment, uh, sending and receiving materials and tracking student progress. Now, our you know, we use Canvas so much more now and web study prior to that to augment these classes. A lot of this has become easier over the years, but still you can't take things for granted. And looking at processes, for instance, when I was trafficking materials back and forth, which sounds like some sort of illicit activity, but it wasn't, <laughs> student essays, 
from uh, Marenzi and Duncan to uh, our campus, they had uh, buses going back and forth, um, vans going back and forth every day. And so they could arrange to make that happen, get it right into my mailbox. But of course, anything that I could make electronic was much easier. Uh, so they, they can tell you how to really make things easier on their end and what their concerns are. And that's a great way to open up the dialogue. And then it's really important that you share your expectations and standards as well uh, on those subjects. And so the things that you might address in doing that uh, and establishing your, your partnership is classroom behavior. It's really important, again, not to take this for granted. We can feel like because we're not in that room, oftentimes that microphone is not cued. We don't know if the students are having conversations, that it's really out of our hands, but it's not. Uh, you can talk to the instructor or, or the, the proctor and, and let them know that if students are talking, that, that they need to know that that's not appropriate behavior, that they're disrupting the class and making it difficult for others that um, there may be other proactive measures that need to be taken. Um, the sound, you may have the choice, if you're just teaching to one ITV classroom, I prefer in that case to keep the sound on all the time. If you're teaching to multiple classrooms, then it's important that you have somebody who can cue the microphone, respond quickly, and uh, make sure, because that's one of the really difficult things about a situation like this, as we all know from working with Zoom, is it really affects pacing and the inter interaction with your students. And you have to be careful because uh, one of our sort of instinctive responses may be then to shy away from that. If it becomes difficult and if it slows the classroom down, it slows our pacing down, then we might not interact as much as we should. Uh, that can become a, a particular temptation if you have a live audience in front of you, because then they, that your attention just naturally gravitates towards them because you get that instantaneous interaction. Protocols for quizzes and exams. Again, very, very important. Uh, I, the proctors in the classes I'm teaching right now, they'll walk around during the quizzes. Uh, we have arrangements so that we arrange times for makeup so that we have a proctored quiz. The students aren't taking it on their own, even though they're taking it online. And it avoids a lot of problems and processes for taking attendance. It may be simple and easy for you to just take attendance, uh, or you may want to have a spreadsheet that you move back and forth, or just a daily email coming from the proctors. But these are, these are some things that you'll work out in your partnership. Grade notifications, I would say this is key. Uh, you really, with, with dual enrollment, want to have early grade notifications. What I generally try to do is in the first few weeks with low stake assignments, I really monitor them closely. And when I have students who aren't turning in their, their assignments, I notify the proctor, I notify the student, and I notify the counselor at the school. That way everybody knows before it develops into a long-term pattern and we really have trouble because in this case, the intervention is going to come from them, right? And so if I put up the distress signal, then that intervention comes and generally they deal with it quite effectively. Not always, you know, sometimes the students just don't want to do the work. And it works that way. But this way, I've done my due diligence. I have tried to work with the student and resolve any issues, and we can move forward. So don't just wait until midterm. Uh, if you can do these things early on, it really uh, smooths the path for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, Mindy Claridge, as I mentioned earlier, was one of the best proctors that I ever worked with. And she ran a tight ship. And so a couple of years ago, I asked her to share her methods with me so that I could share them with other people. And so these are some of the things that she said she did. She would have a pre-semester talk with the students to tell them what a privilege it was to be taking a college course and how the standards for performance behavior are much different. And this is nice because it was a reality check for students. We get the most motivated students in these classes generally, but not all of them are amongst the most motivated which also means that we have a lot of students who have many extracurricular activities going on, they have heavy course loads, and that really helps to ground them from the beginning and to establish how this class is going to run. She used a folder system to track assignment completion. So anytime students were submitting things, they had a, a folder in the classroom, a, a file folder, and she was always aware of who was or was not doing their work. She didn't need me to tell her that, and that was a huge help. Uh, she monitored the syllabus. She knew the syllabus for each and every class that she was proctoring, and she knew what assignments were due and when they were due. And so, you know, I, all I had to do was make sure that material was available to her. But certainly you could request that uh, a proctor does this or 
give the, the, the proctor advance notice, hey, these assignments are due. Will you please let me know of any students who are not prepared who have not submitted them? She watched the class closely and monitored attentiveness and participation during class. And when she saw problems, she would do things like move students around. She would you know, tactfully address the, the, the situation with the students and, and try and really maintain that classroom environment. Whereas I had other proctors who, who would start the class and go back to their desk and their computer and just forget about what was going on in the class for the entire time. So it, it was a night and day difference in terms of the performance from section to section. Uh, she would walk around the class while students took quizzes and tests. Uh, just having that presence there kept them honest. High school has a culture where cheating is more prevalent. It's, uh, you know, friends sharing homework and things build upon that. And, and, and it really is part of the culture, not to, to cast aspersions upon high school students or dual enrollment, but it's something that you need to be cognizant of and, and ready to, to deal with and hopefully to deal with early on before it becomes a high stakes problem. And she was very good about checking her email daily for correspondences from the instructors. In turn, when I was working with Mindy, I made sure that I never uh, gave her anything that I needed printed and distributed um, any less than 24 hours in advance. So I, I really always tried to be considerate and usually I would try and give her even more advance than that. Uh, and her advice is that each instructor have a detailed syllabus. She says it's extremely frustrating when the students don't know what the short-term and long-term expectations for the course are, so they can't plan. And that's especially, again, very important when you have students with these crazy busy schedules that involve travel and all kinds of activities. They can align their schedules that way. They can figure out when they need to talk to the instructor to uh, arrange to turn in something early or late because of activity and things like that. And she also said, you have to work very hard to keep that classroom time engaging. Uh, having a roster in front of you so you have all the names of your students so you can call upon them by name uh, and, and doing whatever you can to keep them, as with any class, from drifting off. But of course, when you're just a presence on a TV screen, as I am now, uh, it's much easier to drift off. Okay, and that is my short presentation on partnering with your proctors. All right, thank you, Pete. Um, excellent information there on on proctors. Uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna keep going, and we'll do some questions in a moment. Um, Nathan, do you want to go up next? Nathan, are you there? Nate, I think you're muted. Sorry. <laughs> um, so hopefully everyone can see a PowerPoint on your right and a web page on your left. Um, so doing breakout rooms in Zoom is really easy, but you do have to enable it first. Um, and you have to go to the zoom.us website, log in under your account. Once you've logged in, um, it'll have a my account um, hyperlink that you click on, um, it'll take you to uh, basically your, your main page. And I'm gonna get out here. And so uh, you saw reports earlier that Chalet had mentioned where you can do attendance. Um, if you go up just to settings and click on settings, um, uh, you'll get into here uh, meeting settings. What you're gonna wanna do is click on in meeting advanced. And again, if I'm going too fast for you, I'm, we're going to have instructions for you to, uh, written instructions, and I'll make a video too. Uh, you click on in meeting advanced, and you'll see down here, uh, breakout room. You need to enable that so that it's blue. Um, and allow host to assign participants to breakout room. I like to enable that too, so I like to keep that, that uh, checked. Uh, once that is done, um, you will be able to do breakout rooms. And so it will look um, something, uh, a little icon on your uh, bottom menu will appear when you are the person uh, in charge of the Zoom conference. It will appear, you'll see breakout rooms, you'll be able to click on that. And once you click on that, 
um, you'll get a pop-up that looks like this, where you can assign the number of how many breakout rooms you'd like. And if you would like it to randomly assign the number of individuals to that breakout room, you select automatically. If you want to choose the individuals that go to which breakout room, you click on manual uh, and then um, you create rooms. Just a, a real quick best practice for Zoom breakout rooms, two to three students per breakout room works best. I've been, uh, I did it a lot last semester. And when you have four or five in a breakout room, it's just too many and a few students will tend to not participate as much as you would like. Um, there are lots of options in breakout rooms, um, which I will address in uh, some videos to uh, some videos I will send out later. Um, but uh, you can click on options and you can see all of the different uh, different options that are available to you in breakout rooms. It's a great resource. It is inter allows the students to be interactive so that they aren't just sitting there listening and getting death by PowerPoint. And so uh, great, great, great tool. Okay, I am going to go ahead and let the next person go. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to John now. All right, morning everybody. I'm excited to be here with you. Um, so my part of this of the the presentation today uh, has to it goes back to when we first started Canvas um, almost two years ago. Uh, I had a pretty steep learning curve, and it required me to look up several YouTube videos and Google searches and call Nathan and call Aaron and beg people for assistance to figure out how to do this stuff in Canvas. Well, what I've done is I've, I've chosen a handful of items that I um, have condensed into just a few simple instructions uh, to help those of you that are, 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 maybe you're old pros at this, maybe you're just getting into Canvas, but these are some things that I found to be most helpful um, when I started using this. So let me share my screen and I'll, I'll start walking you through these. Let's see, screen one. Okay, so the first thing that I was going to show you as we're looking at the dashboard here, um, I wanted to walk you through. Oh, wait, there it is. Stand by one. Uh, the first thing is nicknaming courses. Um, I don't know how many of you have uh, several sections of the same course, but I found when I started using Canvas, I had three sections of one class and it was very difficult for me to keep them in order. And so I had to, I'd click in one, go back out of it, click in another one, go back out of it, click in the third one. And finally that was the class that I needed. Um, but to do this, all you have to do so that you can customize the card uh, on the front of your dashboard is click on these three little dots on this nickname. You're gonna put, I'll put med dosage Tuesday, Thursday. And if I really want to get, you know, OCD about all of this, which is kind of my, that's kind of my jam, right? I'm pretty OCD. I like things organized and orderly. I can also choose the color that I want all of those sections to be. So I can choose this to be blue and then I'm going to apply it and it changes the nickname and it also changes the color. So now when I go through this, I can make all of my medical dosage classes the same color they're all going to be nicknamed. They're all going to be right next to each other. And it's very easy for me to navigate. Okay. Um, the next item I wanted to show you is uh, being able to find past courses. So for those of you that have done this for a semester or two, there might be a time where you'd need to go back in and check a, a previous student's grade or um, find a, a piece of material that you needed to, you need to update into one of your other Canvas shells. And so it's as easy as this. Okay. You go to courses, you go down here to the bottom to all courses, and now you have a list of every single class that you have ever taught in Canvas. And you can enter those and look at the information and see those grades and see uh, whatever document repositories you've used and um, go from there. Uh, the next item I wanted to show you was sidebar customization. Okay, now along with my OCD, I'm very particular in what I, what I want my students to see and not want them to see because I build my, my shells very specifically. 
Um, as you can see, when it comes to organization, I like them to be very, um, you know, module one, module two, module three, and so on. Uh, but there's also several items here that I don't want my students to see. I don't want them to see collaborations or this syllabus because I add it in in a different way, okay? Um, and so to customize this bar so that they can see certain things or not see certain things in on the student end, you're gonna click on settings. You're gonna go up here to the navigation tab. And then you, this will give you the opportunity to click on any of these items and you can drag it down to where it's hidden. Um, you can take it, drag it back up to where it can be seen by your student. And then once you are done customizing this how you want it, you just come down here and you click save. Um, and the great thing about this is if you have, if one of the things that I, I love about Canvas is you can make it work for you. It's like, a, it's like a business, okay? You want it to be making money when you're not there, right? And so you wanna set it up so that it's working like your employee and it's doing the job for you if you've got several sections to take care of. And so being able to use these customization features is, is absolutely huge, okay? Um, next item, and there's a couple, I apologize for, for taking so long, but uh, this next one that I have here, I wanted to show you guys how to find quiz statistics. Now, I don't know how many of you are still using Scantrons. Um, I still do uh, for some of my, my written exams, but with the Scantrons, there's also an analytics sheet that will give you the information when you run it through to see how many questions people missed, what the average score was, what the, the range of scores were, um, and who missed what questions. We use it pretty regularly in, in our EMS classes. In order to find your test analytics, what you'll do is you'll go to your, the, the whatever page it is in your class that you want to look at. You're gonna click on um, modules. You're gonna find the quiz that you wanna analyze. So here's my quiz two, I'm gonna click on that. And then after everything has been submitted, you can click on this button right here, quiz statistics. And what this provides you with is an analysis of all of the answers that have been chosen by your students. So it gives you what the scores were, some scored very poorly, some did very well, but it gives you also how many students answered correctly and the percentage of correct answers, um, what other answers they might've had. And so if you ever were inclined to score on a curve or you wanted to increase the, the score average to be able to uh, meet the needs of the class, this would allow you to see all of the answers and all of the, um, the data uh, so that you can adjust that as needed, okay? Um, I don't know how many of you use that, but I use it pretty regularly and I found it to be exceptionally helpful. All right, next item. And this is, this is gonna be a little bit more complicated, okay? These have been pretty easy. This one's gonna be a smidge more complicated, but, but bear with me, okay? Um, so what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna go to whatever class it is that you want to, um, oh, let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm gonna show you how to add a bit, how to add a video into Canvas, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this class. And again, I, I have all these instructions written out. We're gonna put them in, in uh, knowledge base. You guys are on the R drive. You guys are gonna see them. So if you don't catch it the first time, that's okay. Uh, so anyways, I'm gonna click on modules and I'm gonna find the uh, module that I want to add my video to. So I have this practice module that I created and I added a section or a page called practice videos. I'll click on um, that assignment or that, uh, that uh, page that I've created. I'm gonna click on edit. And then this little magical mystery icon right here, record upload media. It's amazing, okay? You're gonna click on this and this little page will pop up. Now, you can either do a media recording where you're just recording your voice, or if you wanna show them your, your delightfully happy mug, you can also make a video of yourself by selecting video file, uh, or I'm sorry, let me go back. Cancel, record media, and I'm gonna choose my webcam. So what this will do, and, and I think because I'm actually using my webcam, it won't allow me to do this, but you'll choose webcam, and then you'll start recording and it'll give you a little countdown. And then you can proceed to record yourself on this video. Now, the cool thing about that, if, if any of you remember, um, 
back at or when we first did the the web study transition they wanted us to have a video or a picture an introduction on the main page and so this would be a great thing to actually add to your home page at the beginning okay so that's making videos of yourself and my last item is how to upload a video from youtube okay lots of different social media platforms out there that you can uh get videos from but youtube is one of my favorites uh, and it's actually very, very easy to do this. So from the same location, okay, so I'm gonna go back to the page I wanna add the video to, my practice videos. I'm gonna click on edit, and I'm gonna click on insert or edit media, and this, this pops up. Now I'm gonna go to my YouTube channel and I found this awesome 24 string bass guitar solo that was just wicked awesome, I loved it. Um, so I, I'm gonna share that with my students because it's amazing. All I do is I go right here to the bottom and I click share, copy URL, I go back to the module, I paste it into the, the area right here, click okay, once I've got it, I'm gonna click save and it's now part of your page. So what I've done in, in several of my classes is I have their materials, the presentation materials, and I've added all of their uh, PowerPoint presentations. I've also added videos of past instructors. I've added uh, videos of how, like how to do certain um, things with, for the class. Um, and I've just found it to be super helpful. So I hope this has been a, a, a rapid but good little introduction to some of these finer points that, that took me several, several days to figure out. Um, and I will get those instructions posted for everybody. So thank you. John, that is fabulous information. Um, I'm hoping folks take notes. And yes, all of this will be available afterwards. Um, all right, Chase, no. Um, Aaron, Aaron, you're up. Aaron, we can't hear you if you're talking. Sorry, I uh, was busy getting on my screen all shared. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, but, so I'm gonna go over just a couple of things. I, I hope you can all see my screen now. Can you see copying an existing course? We're good. Fantastic. Uh, so John, uh, thanks for leading us through all of that super important stuff. Um, now, once you're done with all of John's important edits, uh, the next challenge becomes rebuilding that same course again the next semester. Um, but the good news is you don't have to. You don't have to do it all over again. Uh, you only have to be as amazing as John Clegg one time and then you're set because the next semester you can go ahead and copy an existing course. Now there's a couple different ways we can do this. Um, <clears throat> the first way uh, to do this would be to copy from your own past courses. And so when you go into Canvas, you all you have to do is click over here on import existing content. And when you do, it'll bring you to this import page. You'll select the second option, copy a Canvas course, which brings you to your list of courses. And you select the one that you want to copy from a previous semester, or even from that semester if you're, if you're duplicating a, a current semester course. Uh, once you do that, you want to make sure that you click the all content here. And I used to try the adjust events and due dates. I no longer even click that because Nathan's about to show us an amazing way better way to handle the dates. And so I'm just going to leave that to him. And, and so I don't even worry about that. I just click all content. I hit import and it brings us to this screen. It uh, will first say queued and then running. And once it gets to 100%, in all cases, except for one that we encountered yesterday, it will then say done or completed. And once it's completed, you go back to your course homepage and the previous course is completely duplicated. All the quizzes, all the questions, uh, all your videos, uh, everything is, is reposted. And so all those customizations that John taught us how to make, you, you keep them all. You don't have to duplicate your efforts. 
Uh, so the other way that is very, very useful sometimes and this, uh, some people have used to share with other instructors here at EAC, some people have used to move material between uh, different institutions where they teach. Uh, you can even go ahead and get a course from out of nowhere. I mean, from somebody who you don't even know, uh, but that would be from Canvas Commons and you start the same way. So you start in a blank shell, you go to import from Commons and that brings you to this Commons homepage. And in the search bar, you'll type in whatever the title is of, of your course. So microburkology is my personal microbiology course that I don't necessarily want everyone in the world to download, but I wanted to know how to find it. So there it is. Uh, so you click on that. Uh, it brings you to that course details. It'll show you a little preview. When you click import download, uh, you then can tell it where you'd like to import it to, which uh, shells you'd like that course copied into, and you hit import into course. Now, this is going to take a little bit. Um, when you do that, it's not going to be immediately done uh, unless it's a very, very small course. But for me, uh, because I'm a little like John and a little bit OCD with my courses, it took actually a couple of hours uh, for this particular course to upload all the way. So if you go to the course right away, it's gonna say you have successfully started the import, uh, but it'll take a little while before you get to see the actual course. But, but it'll pop up and again, the whole course now is built. Uh, there's chats popping up. I hope I'm not talking too fast. <laughs> Um, but this will be shared too. Um, I also wanted to talk about appropriate rigor and most of you that have been listening or even some of you that haven't have heard me talk a lot about rigor and about Respondus Monitor. I think it's a, a wonderful program, but I, I wanted to tell you guys also, I did create this module. It's called the EAC Respondus module. It's on Canon, on, on Canons, on Commons. So all of you can download it. And it just has this simple little plugin to put into any of your um, modules within your course. It's going to be a quick start guide for for Respondus so that your students can just like literally all you'll have to do is plug this in and the students will do the rest. They'll just get on Respondus. Um, you won't even really have to talk about it much, but you can and I'd love to another time. Uh, so when you go to Respondus Monitor though, it's going to take you uh, here to their initiation page and then it will list all of the quizzes that you've built within a course and so for uh, demonstration purposes I had disabled uh, Respondus Monitor for celebration of knowledge number four here uh, so that I could show you so right here you would go to settings um, from settings it would open first whether or not you want to use the lockdown browser once you say require Respondus lockdown browser the window will expand, giving you the option of requiring uh, Respondus Monitor. Once you require Respondus Monitor, it's gonna give you your first time this little, uh, little blurb about what Respondus is. And then you just hit save and close and it will then enable Respondus Monitor for the quiz that you already built. It really only takes about 20 seconds to to get set up. Uh, now, once you have administered a test on Respondus, you'll come to class results and Respondus will take the time to tell you not only uh, how long it took and how many points everyone earned, but you can see here the review priority. And so it tells you if it's a video you even need to pay attention to, uh, what the system's idea was about the likelihood that that student may have been trying to cheat. I love, 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 love the opportunity to administer exams at any time of day, uh, any place that the student wants. And students overwhelmingly have, have given me super positive feedback about the flexibility. Uh, and then I've had faculty also give me uh, great feedback about the uh, modified scores that they started getting once students were proctored in exams. So for me, super duper exciting. Uh, another thing as far as um, academic rigor in online and virtual uh, distance courses goes, I wanted to just mention question banks. It's a, a really great testing tool. And I, 
I learned from talking to people that some people weren't aware of it. So when you go into your test, you have the option here at the bottom of forming a new question group. Um, when you hit the new question group, these groups of questions will come up. Then to add questions, uh, you just go right here in the circled spot, hit that plus, and it'll give you the option of questions. But the beauty of question groups is that you can tell it how many questions you want from that group for students to answer and how many points per question. And so uh, in this particular exam, this exam covered four chapters and I like to do 50 question tests. Um, but as it happens, I came up with uh, just over 120 questions over those four chapters. So for each chapter, I have about 30 questions and then I tell it how many questions from each chapter to pick. So students, besides the fact that they're being proctored, uh, literally probably no two students had the same test, but uh, all the material was covered and, and well assessed. Uh, now, John already taught us about nicknaming courses and finding past courses because he's such a stud. Uh, combining sections. This is maybe to me the most useful uh, piece of Canvas knowledge that I've ever gained. So I don't know if your dashboards look like mine, but my dashboard at the beginning of a semester looks overwhelming. There are so many courses and there's labs for the courses and there's all these different things. So if you'll uh, just pay attention here to the first two, this gray online, uh, 160 online spring 2021, and the next one, introduction to human anatomy and physiology. Uh, those are my two online bio 160 sections that I'm going to be teaching. Now, everything that I post to one, I also want to post to the other. Uh, I manage my two online courses exactly the same as each other. And so you can actually just combine the two sections <laughs> into one shell. To do that, you will select the 160 online, the, the one that you want it to stay. The, so like the, the main course, the one that you want to keep on your dashboard. When you come into course details uh, in settings, it's going to have this course code. It's also listed as an SIS ID. Um, you're going to go ahead and highlight that and copy it. You'll then come back to the dashboard and go to the section that you want to have uh, embedded within the first section. So for me, 0579, I'd like this shell to disappear and to become part of this shell. And so you click on this 0579 shell. And when you get inside, you click next on settings, come to sections within settings. And here you see the section of this shell. So 0579. You're going to click on the section number and it's going to bring you to this page for that section. Over on the right, you'll see crosslink this section. When you click on crosslink this section, you'll then go ahead and enter the copied information. Now it's important and it, it seems silly, but after you put in that course code that you copied from the first course, you're going to hover down and click on the the populated name of the course that Canvas gives you. Once you've clicked on that, uh, sorry, you'll go ahead and hit crosslink this section and you'll get this message, section successfully crosslinked. Jennifer calling from Barron's Auto Collision. How are you? Ah, no bad, thank you. Hi, Pedro. I was calling to confirm your appointment. Uh, so the next thing you'll do once it says that the section was successfully cross-listed, uh, if you go back to your dashboard, you'll see 0579 no longer exists. It's now a part of my 0508. And so everything that I post within this shell will show up for both sections for all the students within both sections. So uh, for me, that, that was a fantastic piece of information. And Nathan is next. So I will stop sharing my screen. Love you guys. Bye. Thanks, Aaron. These are such cool tips. All right, Nathan, what can you wow us with? All right. So hopefully um, you've already been wowed by this calendar tip. But if you haven't, um, as you as Shalay mentioned earlier, uh, if you were here at the beginning, um, it's really easy to move quiz uh, in, um, assignments around on your calendar. You can all hear me, right? I'm not talking to myself. You're good. OK. Um, um, 
and that's really nice and all, but it's really not useful if you've got to go beyond one month. Um, and so what you got to do in order to um, do dates quickly, so let me just uh, really quickly show you how to do that. Again, if you didn't get a chance to see my video, you go to assignments, click on assignments in your whatever class you want to deal with. And then you come over here to where these three uh, dots are on the right, it says assignment settings. You click on it and the very first uh, option is edit assignment dates. And when you click on edit assignment dates, um, you got all of your assignments right here and you can quickly go through and um, put in the dates that you need throughout all of your assignments throughout the semester. Um, just a quick note that anything that has a due date is what actually shows up on the student's calendar. So this date is what's going to show up on their calendar um, if you put in a due date. Um, make sure you click save on more than one occasion. I have forgotten. I've edited all of these dates and then I forgot to click save. And guess what? I had to do it all over again. No fun whatsoever but this is way faster than going into each assignment and doing them individually. Thanks. <laughs> we just had a chat that says this, that tip is gold. And I just want to echo um, Greg, it, this tip and all of them that you've given, this is just fabulous. Okay. Um, it is now Chase's Me. turn. Yeah. Hi everybody. So I'm going to show you a really, uh, we've had great tips all morning, but I'm going to show you one that I think has really uh, helped with communication in my courses online and also help with um, kind of lowering emails uh, for questions from students because uh, with these scheduled announcements, it keeps them in the know. And something that you can do um, ahead of time. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. So from previous class that I had this summer, you see here I have all of my scheduled announcements. And what I like to do, this is for World of Music. So what I like to do is to do themed announcements, okay? So something that ties in with the class here. So I literally typed all of these <clears throat> before the class started and then scheduled when I wanted them to be released in each module. So I'm going to show you how to do that now. Um, and so coming over here to a new course, I have clicked on announcements. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. And then just need to move my chat real fast. Um, new announcement here. And then see, we can type in, say this would be the welcome. I do the general welcome announcement. Um, post to all sections. This is where uh, you can select what classes you would like for them to go to. But what I would like to draw your attention to is the delay posting. And then there you can select exactly when you would like for your announcement to be released to your classroom. So um, if you have a course calendar, which we all do, we kind of know what is happening throughout the semester. You can type again all of your announcements before the course begins and they will be released at the time that you schedule. Uh, this has been a great help to me and I hope that you all find this a great help as well. Thank you, Chase. That is very cool. Um, all right, we're going to keep moving forward. And so Pete is going to talk to us about communication. Okay, uh, just a, a few of the things that I do. Um, and they really are basics, but hopefully it'll be helpful to somebody. Let's see, you know, I shared the wrong screen, it looks like with me. Is it that? Or can, no, I think I did. Yeah, we can see your, but it's not in, um, not in my power presentation view. Yeah, let me. Oh, okay. So it was there. It was there, just, yeah, just not. In All right. Okay, so my online communication tips for radiating positive vibes through the ether. I, I think that with our, our communication, some of the most important things to consider is number one, our purpose is that our students have no surprises throughout the semester. That's one of the things I really focus on. I want them to know what's coming from the outset and even before the semester begins. And I also want to let them know that my job, and I think all of us, this, this is the basic definition of our jobs as teachers, 
is that we are here to help them succeed. So I really emphasize that from the beginning of the semester that they never need to worry about contacting me, interrupting me, stopping by my office. I got into this work because I love this work and I'm happy to help at any time. So these are some of the things I'm trying to accomplish. And my pre-semester letter is where I begin. And so the things that I include in this letter and what I do is I just go to faculty online about a week before class begins and I get all the student email addresses and I send this out to everybody. Um, and so I let them know that I'm here to help them succeed. I include a copy of the course syllabus. Now with my syllabi at this point in my career, I haven't always done it this way, but I have a, a schedule for the entire semester of all the assignments, major and minor, so that the students know what the course entails. And with classes, uh, you know, some of the really motivated students like to get started in advance. So the syllabus can help them there. It also helps them to gauge their workload so they know what's coming during the semester and they can see if they have a realistic schedule in terms of the, the courses they're taking and their work obligations their family obligations and so on. I share the information for the book, including the edition, the ISBN, and a link to the book from some vendor online. So they can actually go look at the cover, they can see how much it costs to rent, to buy its availability, and uh, really lock things in there if they haven't done so already. I provide a link to the Canvas login page and help resources. I give instructions for logging in, basically tell them, you know, monster uh, email address and uh, password will get them in. Uh, I share the link to the welcome video that I have created for my Canvas courses. And what I do for each of my Canvas courses, and this is fairly recent for me, is I use Camtasia, which is a screen capture program that allows me to do a voiceover. And I can give them a tour of the entire Canvas shell for the class. I can talk about the major assignments, the pacing, show them how to navigate everything. And it, it's going to be there in Canvas in the very first module. This way they can preview the class before they even log in. And it really helps to avoid confusion and, and uh, orient the students towards the class. Uh, I provide a copy of the first assignment. Uh, with literature classes, for instance, uh, some of my students think, well, I can do some reading in advance to give myself a leg up and, and uh, take some of the pressure off the first week. And so what I'll do is I'll go to the textbook and I will bootleg it or else I'll find a copy of it online somewhere and I'll put a link in there and the students can go ahead and get started. And it also, again, familiarizes them with the type of material that they're covering. And just as a side note, what I try to do with my classes, and we're using OER more and more, but what I've always tried to do with my classes is to make the text available in copy for the first two weeks of class. Because invariably I have a lot of students who are waiting on financial aid or have other issues and will not have a text during those first two weeks. So if I make it available to them online, nobody falls behind. Um, and then uh, one of the most important things I try to stress is that I'm inviting the students to contact me whenever they have questions or concerns. They are, they're never imposing in doing so. And I offer credit for responding to the email with a brief introduction. And in all my classes, that's the first assignment. Send me an email. If it's a Canvas class, their assignment is to send me a brief email, me and actually the entire class, introducing themselves. If it is a face-to-face uh, -face class, it goes through monster mail. But I want them to be able to use those systems so that they know how to contact me in that manner. And these are the communication strategies that I have throughout the semester. Uh, so I, I try and make a good introductory video, as I've stated before, the tour of Canvas. Uh, I make all of the modules and assignments for my course visible from the beginning of the semester. I want them to be able to go in there and say, gosh, what's this midterm essay? What am I going to have to do? And if they can read through the requirements of that, they see it coming, they can anticipate it, they can make a schedule. Uh, theoretically, it's all there for them to, to do that and, and pace. Now, with quizzes and certain assignments that I, I want um, you know, kept secure or that are part of the pacing of the class, I won't open those up. But generally, they'll I'll have instructions and a discussion of them so they know how they work before they ever take them. I try and clearly state the protocols for responding to emails. And of, of course, all of my communication protocols, I give the information for contacting at my, me at my desk, where my office is, and make sure that they know how to use those. And that first assignment opens up that, that channel of communication. 
My practice is to respond to emails every business day. I, I check them first thing in the morning. And as I'm sure all of you know, in, in this age of information, that could be an hour of work easily. Uh, but that's a really reassuring thing to students, especially if they've had a, a, some sort of a problem or a pressing question the day before. If I can get to it first thing in the morning, it really keeps them on the right track and it lets them know that, that I'm, I'm really there to, to help them progress. Uh, and then I check them in the afternoon as well. I don't check them on the weekends. And unless if I, if I have a pressing assignment, maybe the midterms, midterms coming due, I will. I'll check them on Saturday on Sunday. But otherwise, I don't. But the, the, the big, uh, the, the most important thing that you do to make that successful is that if the students do have problems over the weekend, you address them first thing Monday morning and fix them. So the students who say, oh, this quiz malfunctioned on me, or I had some sort of a, a problem arise in my life that kept me from submitting this assignment or, or whatever it may be. Because as, as we know, with, with online students, a lot of them are completing their work on the weekends as when they have time. Your understanding going and you, you fix it all and get them on the right path the first thing Monday morning. And students never complain about me not being in contact with them on the weekends. Uh, I respond heavily to early assignments in order to encourage the students and to establish performance standards. Uh, if if they've, they've never taken a course like mine before, then they're really uncertain about what I expect. And of course, I, I, chances are I'm a new instructor to them as well. So for me to be able to go into the forum discussions and into other places and to really point out their strengths and what they're doing well and to coach them and, and, and to advise them how to you know, continue to improve their performance. It, uh, it, it helps them a lot. And again, it lets them know that they're not just floating around out there in cyberspace, um, that they're connected to their teacher and to their class. And along with that, and this is something admittedly I don't do as well as I should, but it's, it's a great concept that I've talked to my colleagues about and I've tried to implement it. And that's high touch reinforcement. That is scheduling throughout the semester opportunities. And Shalaya, it sounds like, is doing an excellent job with that. I was really impressed with the, the things that she presented. Um, is scheduling opportunities to contact each student individually throughout the semester, uh, to offer support, to praise their work, and to really, especially, again, with the way these classes are constructed, particularly mine, the contributions that the students make to the class benefit everybody in the class. If, if they're creating good intellectual discussions of material and issues that we're dealing with, uh, it just really makes it a great experience for everyone. So I, I really try to recognize those things and make that contact. Uh, I provide examples of assignments and tutorial videos whenever possible. I, I really want, again, students to understand expectations, to be able to look at models and say, oh, okay, here's what I need to do. Here's how this works. Uh, and I'm, I'm responsive then to questions that students present. And whenever it seems like it's a question that the entire class would be interested in discussing, I send a, 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 an email out to everybody and I, and I address it with everybody so that um, everybody benefits. Okay, and that is the end. Thank you, Pete. All right, um, we've got just a few more minutes and Chase and Nathan both have a little bit more to share with us. So Chase, I'm gonna let you do your two parts and then Nathan and, um, and we should be able to wrap things up. Chase, we don't hear you. Oh, where did Chase go? Is he still here? Oh, there. No, I don't see Chase. Uh, he's on Jeff Despain's computer now, but he's there. Oh, there you are. Okay. So you're up, Chase. But you may not be able to share the screen from Jeff because he probably doesn't have permission to share the screen. We can't hear you. There you go. I thought I got can you hear me now? Yep, we can hear you now. Okay, so attendance was one thing I wanted to share. There is a golden document on knowledge base called uh, Academic Related Activities. Um, that does a really great job at explaining um, what is considered in a weekly involvement 
in classes, either at face to face or online. Um, and I would recommend all of you all taking the chance to read that. Um, and so the title of that is Academic Related Activities There uh, on Knowledge Base. Great thing to use, great thing to have in your arsenal um, when questions arise about attendance uh, with students online. Okay, and I'll pass it on to Nathan to keep it short. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Chase. Nathan. Okay. All right, so uh, just real quick, um, there is a load of technology out there. I'm sure many of you, if you've been around for a little while, you've been approached by many different vendors. Um, there is a ton of diff great things out there. As far as technology is concerned, uh, a couple years ago, I talked to you about things like Remind, uh, Flipgrid, uh, Padlet, um, all really good opportunities for, for technology. And I just really quickly wanted to list a few. Uh, one that I'm missing on here and uh, one that um, Chase used last year to, to get some feedback was uh, something called WeTransfer. Um, if you would like to learn a little bit more about WeTransfer, please talk to Chase about that. Um, and that's good for really large files, um, getting large files to and from your students. Um, here is just a quick list of all of the things that, that are out there. There's a lot of good video sharing applications. Um, Loom is one that I use that allows me to do quick, less than five minute videos um, for free. Um, I understand that Screencastify is about the same. Of course, many of you know about YouTube. Just a FYI, if you're interested in learning more about using videos and creating videos for your classes uh, and embedding them, them into Canvas, I've got a leader shop coming up. I believe the first one's uh, next week. Let me really quick bring that up. I've got it right here, I think. Oh, I think I shut it down. Anyway, uh, please look at the leader shop schedule. Um, there's two of them coming up really quickly. And if you need help, uh, creating those class videos, um, I'm, I'd be happy to help you with that. Um, lots of good quiz, quizzing and game applications. I've used Kahoot. Top Hat um, is another one that I really like, um, but it does cost. Um, uh, uh, quizzes and Bamboozle is a game one. Uh, Quizlet is a flashcard first and fo foremost application, um, but it is really, really useful. There's a ton more here that I wish you had time to talk about. I was gonna show you a couple of them, but I think we're, we're running out of time. So let me really quickly uh, end by uh, pointing you to a book um, that has really been useful for me in understanding how to do online classes. And this book was written um, for our, the new normal. Okay, um, it was written over the past year with the new normal in mind. They have online video examples um, that you can go to a website and look at some examples, um, but really gives me, gave me a really good idea of what I needed to do to change and make my class more engaging for the student. Because what do students do? Don't go to this website. This was something else I was gonna do. This is what they do if you uh, don't engage them in your class, you see the ceiling. How many of you see the ceiling? Raise your hand when you turn on a Zoom class. I mean, that's what I see. I see the ceiling and this is what I've seen a few times, students sleeping um, and you've got to engage them. And some of the great, great um, opportunities for engaging them is, let me jump to another slide here real quick. Um, if you get your students into a routine, and I think we've kind of heard that throughout a couple of other. Oh, I'm getting feedback. Uh, Tammy, can you mute yourself? Thank you. Okay. Um, um, anyway, so routines, one of the biggest things I love about this book is it talks about something called pause points. And I mentioned to you early that I used to do, I'm known for quizzes. Well, it's the same thing. You're engaging your students by asking specific questions or getting them engaged. 
Zoom chat is like the gold mine of Zoom when it comes to engaging your students. We've been doing it right here today. Ask them questions, tell, give them something to do while they're talking to you. Some really important things with pause points. Uh, oh, that's the reasons. Um, you want to do them early and frequent. Uh, you want to do get them engaged within the first three minutes of your class and do them every five to 10 minutes uh, throughout your class with a maximum of 20 minutes. There's a reason why TED Talks are at no more than 20 minutes because you're, you're going to lose your audience if you, you don't engage them uh, frequently. So definitely take, take, op uh, take, take that opportunity. The other thing I love to do, we all hate death by PowerPoint, and yet that's exactly what we've been doing today. <laughs> but um, we all hate death by PowerPoint. So use a virtual whiteboard. One of the things that Zoom has available to you is a virtual whiteboard. And uh, you can ask from IT to get a little uh, electronic USB pad and a pen, and or you can use your um, iPad and you can use it as a whiteboard and pretend like you are right there in front of your students um, writing on the whiteboard. Wonderful technology. And I've already talked about useful technology and we are out of time, so I'm gonna end right there. So this is fabulous. There two, two quick points before I let you all go. One, Nathan just showed a book um, that he's read. I have talked with um, Tammy Powers, who is our new Director of Library Services about having a potential book club for virtual teaching. And it could be a book like this we read or some other book. If you think that you would be interested in that sort of a book club and participating in that, shoot me or shoot um, Tammy uh, a quick message. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing. Second, I want you to know that um, we are contracting right now with Canvas for 24 seven support during this COVID time for faculty and students. I recognize that we may have um, an increased need um, to answer questions. Tammy in the library and Jared, they do a great job answering students. We're hiring a CTL director, but that person hasn't been hired yet. So right now, um, and I think this will start February 1st, we will have access and I'll send more information, but it will be 24 seven um, support from Canvas itself. Um, and last, um, we have a need for um, a strong leader to lead the e-learning initiative as part of one of our strategic initiatives. If anybody out there in Zoom land says, oh, I would love that opportunity, shoot me or um, Kenny Smith uh, a message on that. Um, and it's now 1033. So I'm going to let you all go. Um, I, I will stay in here for a moment if anybody has a question. Um, but that's it. You guys are fabulous. Thank you so much for attending. And thanks to our master teachers online. You guys did a great job and gave us some fabulous tips. Thank you. Dr. Wood? Yes. Are we still on for 3.30 this afternoon, correct? For the science division chairs, or excuse me, division chairs. We are 3.30 this afternoon for a listening session for division chairs. Thank and you, I think I sent a Zoom link. Okie dokie, thank you. Hey, thanks. Susan, I have a, a question I wanted to talk to you about really quick based okay. on something in the chat. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> When we are copying, if you have multiple sections of a course, like for example, I'll use what I was struggling with last week. I teach a face-to-face -face sports psychology course and a, a DHA psychology course. When you try to copy the course, it doesn't identify which section you're trying to copy from. It only uses the, sh the short name of the course. It doesn't let you modify that. So you don't know if you're going to accidentally override a course that, you, that you've done and that you need. 
Um, so I talked to Craig O'Donnell about it and he said that we need to look at a way to distinguish our course sections from one another within Canvas. We can't just give them redundant names. We have to be able to see the full name and that might be a programming thing, but he's not sure if it'll affect things on the back end. But I think that's something we really need to look into um, because it's really challenging to navigate that. Okay. Aaron, uh, you, you've got a comment on that? I do. So it is a programming thing um, and it, it wouldn't be a hard fix, but in the interim, Seneca, I'll show you how to uh, figure out and list just for yourself. It won't stay within Canvas, uh, but what I always do before I copy anything, I actually have a list of all my courses and I, I'll show you how to figure out which section each one is ahead of time so you know exactly which one you're copying. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Aaron. Any Could, any other questions or concerns before I end the meeting? Well, I've got a couple things. Could the I have I have the same issue regarding being able to identify which section is which when I'm wanting to copy a course. So, could, were you able to send that out maybe to faculty in general? Um, maybe others have the same same issue. Absolutely, and and I will tell you, programming it would be. Uh, easier. I, I mean, for them to program it for us would be easier, but I'll, I'll make a little video about how to figure it out and send that out to, to I just strongly convinced Craig that it would not totally ruin all of Canvas if you would just change it to sports psychology online for me. On, on that <laughs> it took about 20 minutes, there, but he did it. There are several things that would not ruin Canvas if they <laughs> would click a button for us. So, so one of the things that I'm hoping is that um, the new CTL director will learn some of these things as our Greg Watson um, knew and we'll be able to do that. But right now we got to find the, um, the workarounds. Right. Thank you. I have a quick question regarding the R drive. Um, yes. Question, comment. I don't, um, this was a really cool presentation and many of the materials are going to be available in the R drive um, is what people were saying. So that's excellent. Um, my question, comment, concern is that not all adjunct instructor, instructors have access to the R drive. How can they access these amazing materials? So Elizabeth, I've sent a message to Tom because I had the same thought and, um, and tried to figure out if maybe there's a place on knowledge base. So that might be a solution there, but I'll let everybody know what solution I, I come to. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. But yeah, I thought of that as well. Okay, anything else? All right, those of you who are on diversity committee, I'll see you in 20 minutes. And uh, we've got a board meeting, so um, that won't involve all of you, but it will involve me. So I've got a busy rest of the day. You guys have a busy rest of the day getting ready for classes. Um, and it, it, this is just a fabulous place to work. Look at all of these wonderful people. You, you all are an absolute pleasure to work with. Okay. Have a good one all. Right back at you. Thanks, Susan. All right. Bye-bye.